Okay, hey y'all, good morning. Um, my name is Sally. I think I know everyone that's here right now today, but if people view the recording, I'm the row crop entomology specialist at the Tidewater AREC for Virginia Tech. On the screen now is my email, um, our blog, which all the specialists at Virginia Tech contribute to, and my cell number. Please, 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 if you need to reach me over the summer, use that mobile number. You can call, text, uh, whatever you prefer, but I do not get back to emails in an expedient manner. And that's just a reflection of, of spending most of my time outside. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about soybean pests. I don't know. Why my slide's not advancing. And I'm, I'm not gonna talk um, a lot about the things that we saw earlier this year, but it, it was a slug year um, for several people in Virginia. And what I mean by a slug year is the soybean and corn came up. It didn't get off to a good start. It was wet, it was cold, it stayed small and vulnerable for a long time. And that's when slugs do their most damage. And you see the slug feeding on the slide, rasping on the corn leaf. Um, they're going after corn and soy. They cause window pane damage. Really, it's more dramatic in soybean because if they kill that cotyledon, they kill the plant. And the greatest threat is young plants. Um, and really what, what we look at is um, a lot of situations demand replanting. There are slug baits. They're metaaldehyde and iron phosphate. They work well. They don't work well in really wet conditions. So it's, um, I guess, kind of a catch-22 in a way where Slugs are a problem in wet weather, but the control methods we have don't work in wet weather. A lot of people try cultural practices. If you go to full tillage, you'll control them, but obviously that's not a place we want to return to. Um, you can try for planting dates. So some people up in the mountains will wait till the soil is warm and it's nice and sunny. Being from the east, that scares me. If I get a good planting date, I'm going to take it. Um, so where I want to encourage people to do is just promote fast plant growth, um, even stands, high seeding rates, adequate fertilization, everything you should be doing for your crop. We looked at some feeding preference. So some people think that you can plant into living or newly killed cover crop um, to encourage slugs to either feed on the cover or give your younger plants a chance uh, to not be fed on. So we looked at how much slugs feed on soybean when they have these other cover crops present. So on this slide, if you have a tall bar, it means that the soybean plant was fed on more. The short bars mean the soybean plant was fed on less. So when we had crimson clover and rye offered with soybean, the soybean was fed on more. When slugs were given the option of daikon radish or hairy vetch with soybean, soybean was fed on less. And this is just some preliminary stuff, um, but it does kind of support the idea that there are some plants that are equal or more attractive to slugs than our crops. Your best bet for slug management other than um, agronomic practices is to promote or conserve natural enemies. So ground beetles, granddaddy long legs, fireflies, rove beetles, all these things will eat a slug. And where we have high numbers of natural enemies, we have low number of slugs. So on this graph, um, total predators collected per field is on the horizontal axis. Total slugs is on the vertical. And as we move towards higher numbers of predators caught, we see lower numbers of slugs. And this is a significant relationship. So moving on past our early season into what we're doing now. So the calls I've responded to in soybean thus far have largely been defoliation issues. And defoliation can come from a number of insects. It, it doesn't really matter to me when I think about applying a pesticide, what is there necessarily eating my leaves? I wanna know, do I need to control it? So when plants are small, you can take up to 30-40% defoliation and that, that number is good until about two weeks prior to bloom. 
and it, then it drops to 15% defoliation, and that's its lower point. Now, as the plant matures, we get up to 50% in R6, R7, you're at maturity, you're waiting for those leaves to fall off anyway. I have a, a picture on the slide that's got different levels of defoliation. It's really important when you're estimating defoliation that you pull up that whole plant and you're looking at leaves throughout the canopy. So don't just focus on the top and what you can see. Um, so far as insect identification, so once you know that you have this much defoliation or you have a, a concerning amount, that's when you get that sweep net or that beet cloth out and say what's eating it and then what controls what's eating it. Where a lot of us are right now and my biggest concern, I've, I've gotten a lot of calls um, this week and last about cotton, about peanut, about soybean, about vegetables, all being infested with spider mites. And this time of year, cotton takes up, gosh, the vast majority of my week. And I have not been in a cotton field in the past two weeks where I didn't see mite damage. It's not a concerning level of mite damage, but they are there. Um, and what's happening when it's dry is all those weed hosts and grass hosts that we have beside our fields start dry, drying up and they move into the crop. Um, where people can get in trouble with spider mites is either mowing those grasses or those weeds that really pisses them off will force them into the field, um, or you've sprayed some kind of broad spectrum insecticide, perhaps necessarily or unnecessarily, and there's nothing, there's no natural control left to keep them in check. So these are just a few pictures of what spider mite damage may look like. It starts at the bottom of the canopy, so you may pick it up first along like dirt paths, trails, edges of fields, they're moved into fields by wind, so you'll see a pattern of how they blew in and how they're spreading. And the plants will take on this mottled, sandblasted appearance that you see on the right-hand side of the screen, um, and it will be that those bottom leaves that are affected first. When we look at spraying them, that's an injury threshold, not a count threshold. So you want to see heavy stippling. Well, you don't want to see it. This is, this is when it warrants treatment, is heavy stippling on the lower leaves, some progressing into the middle. Um, the mites are present in the middle. You may see some in the upper canopy, and those lower leaves are yellowing and falling off. Where we have the economic break point um, is the lower leaf yellowing is, is really apparent. Leaves are falling off. Uh, the middle canopy is infested and you see them more in the upper canopy. There aren't a lot of spider mite products. Zeal is a new one, it's translaminar and it has residual. So if I had to choose and that's available, I'm probably gonna go for Zeal. Several um, applications can be warranted for mite control, depending on the, the, the quality of the product and the size of the infestation. I like the residual that you get with, with Zeal. Lures ban is still labeled, whether or not it's available to you in the stores, I'm not sure. It's a very toxic chemical, be careful whenever you're working with it. Agrimac is an abamectin, and abamectin is generic. Most uh, chemical companies will have their own generic version. A lot of times they mix it in-house if there's a lot of veggie production nearby, but technically Agrimac, made by Syngenta, is the only one labeled in soybean. And if you look at our rec guides, and if you look at labels, bifenthrin and some pyrethroids are labeled for spider mites, and I would not do that. Um, so it's not going to clean up the problem 100%. It's not going to get the eggs, and what it's going to do is kill all your natural enemies. So you may walk out there three days after treatment and think, wow, that bifenthrin really knocked them back. But then a week later, you're back to where you were, or you're worse than where you were. So moving on, the other calls I've gotten this year, um, unfortunately, are about kudzu bug. So this animal is back in higher numbers in 2020. I have not seen treatable thresholds. This is what it looks like on a soybean plant on the left. Um, that's the adult. On the right, those are the nymphs, the really funky looking. 
And what they're doing is they have piercing sucking mouth parts as they're sucking um, the sap and the juice out of the plants. They will not be chewing holes in leaves. Thresholds, just as a reminder, because we haven't seen threshold levels in a long time, you really want to wait until nymphs are present because the influx of adults will continue through August. So right now we're in their second generation and they're migrating in and they'll migrate in from now until about mid late August. So if you can wait till you see that they're actually reproducing in the field and you'll want to find a nymph per sweep or five bugs per plant um, to trigger a spray. The good news, they're easy to kill. Any pyrethroid I've tried has worked. Uh, University of Georgia has seen better activity out of bifenthrin in heavily infested fields. So for right now, that's our product of choice. Next week, maybe even this weekend, we'll start seeing our flight numbers for corn earworm increase. Uh, so we're still pretty flat in the tidewater. Looking at northeastern North Carolina is still flat. Um, there have been some moth catches in Surrey. So there's some here. Uh, the peak right now is south of us. So if you look at the numbers in southeastern North Carolina, if you look at the numbers in central North Carolina, they're trending up. And they're usually here by the last week of July, the past few years. This is when we expect them. I don't have 2019 in here. This is just our flight catch data for the tide water um, from 2016 to 2018. And you see that, that the flight really picks up um, right about where we are on the calendar. Thresholds for corn earworm are variable. Um, so it depends on how much soybean is selling for per bushel, and it depends on how much your insecticide costs to purchase and apply. And if you want to play with these numbers, and you know these numbers for yourself, there's a tool, um, NC State and Virginia Tech developed it together. It's called the Corn Earworm Threshold Calculator. And if you Google any of those words with BT or NCSU in them, you will arrive at that site. But just as an example, with a higher cost product in $9 beans, um, one and a half per row foot, or three to four per 15 sweeps. If we're looking at a cheaper insecticide um, at the same price of beans, it's you know three quarters of a worm per foot or one and a half um, to two per 15 sweeps. So it really changes depending on the, the price and the, of a, the application and the price of soybean. Spray products, uh, pyrethroids have worked for us. Um, they, I've also seen them not work. So keep that in mind, they are less expensive. If you're gonna use a pyrethroid, again, use bifenthrin. It's got the highest amount of active ingredient, um, but be prepared to scout after it, just in case you've run into a resistant population. Prevathon and Besiege are good, they give residual. Um, the difference between the two is Besiege has a pyrethroid, so if you have stink bugs, or kudzu bugs or some other kind of bug in the field you want to kill. It's got an, ad, an added active um, on top of worms. The next four are all worm products. Black Hawk, Intrepid Edge, Steward, and Radiant are all excellent choices, um, but all they're going to target is worms. Moving into the season, so as we get into August and September, you're guaranteed to see soybean loopers in your fields at some level. They're really only a problem when they come in early enough that where you still need that foliage on the plant. So you're still trying to make your crop and they're eating. So look, again, look at those defoliation thresholds before making a spray decision. It looks like other caterpillars. It looks a lot like a green clover worm. It'll start feeding at the bottom of the plant. So it may not become apparent you have a problem until you have a big problem. Um, it's resistant to pyrethroids and it's resistant to diamides. It's resistant to certain cry proteins that we find in Bt crops. So that gives us an indication because we don't have Bt soybeans in Virginia or North America that these um, animals are flying or migrating quite a ways to get to us. And it's not really our insecticide selection that's driving this resistance. It's everything that's happening south of us. Thresholds, bloom and pod set, 15% defoliation, R6 and after, 40 to 50. 
there's no number, um, threshold number for these. Greater than five worms per 15 sweeps is suggested, but I think you'll always find that if you go out the end of August. I almost would think 15 to 20 worms, and I wanna see large ones before I pull that trigger because these populations can get big and they can get out of control fast, um, but they are susceptible to a lot of parasitoids, to a lot of natural enemy predation. Um, you, you don't wanna pull the trigger too quick on these guys. Again, just the foliation, if you Google this, there are a lot of examples that you can use and share with your producers. The spray products, um, Prevathon and Besiege are both labeled. I don't recommend them because of the levels of diamide resistance we've encountered. The worm specific products are the products that work. This is Black Hawk, Intrepid Edge, Steward, and Radiant. Intrepid Edge, um, black, uh, really all of them look, this, look comparable. I would, I would be happy spraying any of those products. So these are just some spray results, number of larvae on the vertical by the product um, that you see on the bottom. So the taller bar means that you're leaving more worms at the field. The blue is an earlier date. The orange is, is a later sampling date. And I put this up here um, not to really illustrate that, that Steward works, but if you look at untreated versus Prevathon, there's zero difference. So let's say you put out Prevathon at 14 ounces like we did here, well, you just wasted $14 per acre plus the cost of application. If you didn't do a good identification and you did not realize those are soybean leapers and you put a pyrethroid, so Hero and Brigade are both pyrethroids, your numbers went from 10 per 15 sweeps to 25. So you really do not want to put the wrong product out for a soybean looper. We should anticipate uh, stink bugs coming in end of August. Um, that's typical for Virginia. We've been managing them a long time. Thresholds, uh, half a bug per foot on seed, one and a half for grain. You can use a sweep net, uh, two and a half per 15 sweeps for seed, double that to five per grain. You, I, I've not really swept in a Virginia soybean field without getting two or three end of August. Um, so keep in mind that they're there on some level, but they're not actionable until they, they get to higher numbers. And if you look in the sweep net picture, you see a brown, a green, probably another brown flipped on its back. There's a, um, a green clover worm. There are three or four small corn earworms, there's one large small, or one large corn earworm, there's some aphids. Um, so when you sleep in soybean, you may be dealing with more than one pest complex at one time. So thresholds, um, one of the things that they can cause in soybeans is a delayed maturity. So you could wonder why you still have green stem or why you still have green foliage on the plant that's not going anywhere. What it's responding to is feeding earlier in its life cycle, so feeding at R4 or R5. So it's not the bugs that are still there, it's the bugs that were there during those reproductive stages. It can still occur at R6, but it requires a lot of bugs, so more than four per row foot. Um, Ames Herbert, Dr. Herbert, had a student um, several years ago that demonstrated that damage can occur as late as R7 from stink bugs, but that population has gotta be huge. So eight or more per row foot. And when you're counting these bugs, uh, count all of the adults as one, count large nymphs as one, but count um, nymphs still on like the egg mass as one, don't count them individually. This is just a picture of those maturity delays. Spray-wise, um, you have several options. Orethene has always worked well for us on all species of stink bugs. Brigade is a bifenthrin product. It works well. Um, Warrior II has shown good activity. Most of the pyrethroids have shown good activity. I would use them at the highest labeled rate. And that's for a couple of reasons. So if you go out at the lowest labeled rate, that's still high enough to kill your beneficials. It does not take a lot of pyrethroid to kill a predator or parasitoid. So don't think you're conserving um, 
anything by using a low rate of a pyrethroid. The other concern is ground stink bugs are getting a lot of exposure. They'll be sprayed typically in wheat when people use that, that application to target cereal leaf beetles. Brown stink bugs are there. They're getting sprayed now once in corn. Brown stink bugs are there. And then by the time they get to soybean, they're really the survivors of the survivors of pyrethroids. So be careful. Um, but we do see good activity, usually by fencer and at the highest level rate, it works fine. Belay is not a product of choice for me. It's a neonicotinoid. It also has, I think it may have a pyrethroid in it. It may just, actually it's just a neonic, I think. It will look okay, but the, they'll come back pretty fast. Um, I just wouldn't use that product. So recommendations for stink bugs, use your best judgment. Um, when you're deciding when you want to terminate sprays and soybeans. Um, and usually by that time in the season, y'all, I'm just ready to put the sprayer away. And I think a lot of our producers are too. So use, use restraint, use caution, use good judgment when we are making these later season, season applications. Um, and pyrethroid and orthene work best for stink bug. The problem late season in soybean is you could have an overlap of soybean loopers and stink bugs, both at sprayable levels or not. And this slide just illustrates um, how different products work on this complex together. So the blue lines are soybean loopers, the green lines are stink bugs. Um, the darker colors are, hold on, I need to move my box. Our earlier, so three days after treatment, the lighter colors are seven days after treatment. And what the slide illustrates is, is things like bifenthrin and acetate. We cleaned up our stink bugs, so the short bars mean the product was working great. But if you look at what they did to soybean loopers, they drove the numbers up. Um, similarly, things like Steward, Intrepid Edge, and Prevathon actually looked pretty good at the seven day in this test. And Black Hawk um, did well on soybean loopers. They did not do so good on stink bugs. So Besiege is, here is our one combo product. I've seen it do okay on soybean loopers. I've seen it do nothing at all. Um, so that one is also kind of a shot in the dark. Another slide, same story. So what works for uh, soybean loopers does not work for stink bugs and vice versa. Um, so if, if you have an overlapping pest complex, you're in a situation where you need to decide what is more important, what is likely damaging your crop, what are you most concerned about, and if the answer is both, you may end up having to tank mix or make multiple sprays. So no product works well for stink bug and late season worms. Make your decisions based on scouting and field conditions. Again, if you're not subscribed to the blog, um, please do if you're concerned about the corn earworm flight. Dr. Sean Malone with my program uh, does a wonderful job of having that information out to you every Friday. He posts it, it'll be in, in your inbox Friday morning if you subscribe and you see that subscribe box in tan at the bottom right. I have what's called a soybean cheat sheet and I apologize I think I made this with Ursula or with Josh Holland last year maybe both of them helped um, and maybe some more of you helped and I don't remember um, blame it on my two toddlers or 2020 but we have this um, if you want it I'll send it to you you can print it front and back and keep it in the truck we have some laminated cards but it gives you the insect the threshold some thought points, critical stages and considerations, and then the soybean labeled products. I don't have spider mites on here. I do not have um, kudzu bugs. What will kill a stink bug will kill a kudzu bug. None of these products will kill a spider mite. So if you're running into unique situations, again, give me a call. And that's it. There's my phone number. There's my email. I do respond to emails usually within two or three days at the latest. But if you need a reply right away, and a lot of people do when they have insect problems in their field, call or text me at that 919 number. And I apologize, it's 919, um, but Virginia Tech no longer buys his phones. So I came in in under 30 minutes.
Robbie, is there anybody that has any questions, comments, concerns, or you want to share what you've seen this year so far? Hey, Sally, th thanks for joining us this morning. We appreciate you giving those updates. Um, I know, for, at least for me, I, I would like to get some of those um, cards or, or those resources you were showing us with that table. I think that'd be really helpful for producers to have those, you know, on the dashboard of the truck and that type of stuff. So if, if you could send me that electronically, I'd be glad to, to get some of those printed and, and distribute them out to the growers here. Um, are there any questions from anybody uh, and any of the other agents on the call this morning or uh, Trent, Stephanie, Laura, anything, questions or, or comments you have? Great presentation, Sally. I think you did a great job of covering everything. Thanks, Trent. I think circling back to the beginning, what I didn't say about those natural enemies. So we looked at a lot of things that you could do to mitigate or prevent slug injury in your fields. And we looked at tillage regimes, we looked at cover crops, we looked at herbicide burn down timing, uh, soil type, soil moisture, surrounding geography, crop rotation. I mean, I, th I think there are more. There were probably about 20 variables that we put into this model because we scouted over 6,000 acres for this project. The only thing that affected slug injury was spraying an insecticide with your burn down. So if you put an insecticide out with your burn down, you had more slugs and greater injury. So really encourage producers at, at the beginning of the year when they're applying their herbicides at plant or prior to plant to say, are you, are you throwing something in there for insects? Because a lot of them have been sold on that idea of insurance and, and in reality it's hurting them. Um, okay. Oh, oh thanks. Um, Shelly put the corn earworm economic cal calculator up from NCSU. I love that. I play with it often um, when I see the price of beans has changed on my phone in the morning. And I will send Laura, um, if I can, a copy of this presentation, it may be too big, but I'll definitely send what we call the soybean cheat sheet. And I have those for all the crops I work in, but we don't really manage anything in corn and most of y'all don't have cotton or peanut. So soybean is, is probably the only useful one. Sally, I, I know you touched on the defoliator complex and, and showed us some of those graphics with the different percentage of defoliation and all. Uh, one question that I've had in the past, I haven't received any calls this year, but I have in the past, typically when it, when it tends to get dry like this, um, you, you always hear somebody asking about grasshoppers, you know, coming in, especially when it's really dry and doing a lot of defoliation. Um, in, any comments or, or experience with that as far as maybe what you would recommend, just monitoring that as a, as a typical defoliator with those thresholds that you presented? Yes, so I have seen fields in Virginia, not this year, but in previous years that warranted a spray for grasshoppers, and it, it really surprised me. Um, the producer ended up going out with orthene. We watched it, or I watched it from the road in my truck, and it was like a plague of locusts just running from the sprayer. It was awesome. Um, but if you put out orthene and you have spider mites around, they're going to go crazy because not only have you destroyed their enemies, orthene has something in it that makes spider mites want to do it more, right? So it's almost like an aphrodisiac for spider mites. It's one of the few examples of hormolygosis that we have, um, but that's an actual term that people say use to describe it. It's a response to the chemical. Um, what works for grasshoppers and may surprise you is Prevathon. So as we're heading into the worm flight, if you've got some worms in the field that may be at or close to the sprayable level, you could put Pre Prevathon out and it will get the grasshoppers and the worms. And the nice thing about Prevathon is, is you have about a, a two to three week residual. So at the 14 ounce rate, I'd say a two week residual at the 20 ounce um, closer to three weeks. Uh, but be careful with that. I don't want us to overuse the product. Um, it's, we really 
don't have a lot left in some crops for corn earworm. Soybean, we have a lot of good options. We have Intrepid Edge, we have Radiant, we have Blackhawk. We don't have the same options in cotton. So I like to save the diamides for cotton, um, but I know that's really hard to tell a soybean producer who lives in a non-cotton region, right? Um, but uh, I mean, putting out any insecticides you don't need. So the defoliators, I've seen this year, I've not been grasshoppers, I've been to one sprayable Japanese beetle field, and I've been to one sprayable level green clover worm, which both of them shocked me. Um, we just don't usually get that much of those insects. We have them always, always, always in soybean. They're usually not an actionable level, and this year, for whatever reason, in those fields they were. So when people call me and they say they have something crazy, I'm, I'm not gonna say, nah, -uh, or no. Nah. I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna hop in the truck and go see it. And I'm sure um, that you have the similar experiences with your clients. Yeah, thanks, Sally. That, I, I know I've gotten that question in the past about grasshoppers, so that, that's a good, um, you know, good, good data point there to, to share that. Um, in, any other questions, Trent, Stephanie, Laura, any, anybody else? Uh, anything you've seen from the field or, or gotten questions on this year? Cool. Right. Well, I hope we get rain um, and we can stop talking about spider mites. But if we don't, be, pre be prepared to look and be prepared for those calls because they're coming. All right. Well, thanks, Sally. We appreciate you joining us this morning. Excellent presentation. We, we thank you for all of that. Um, and we'll be glad to share that with the producers with this recording and also the audio version of this. So thank you again for taking the time to join us this morning with that update. Okay. Anytime, Robbie. Have a great week. Or right. Almost Th weekend now. Yeah. All right, thank you, Sally. I also, I'd like to thank uh, the group that makes this effort possible, um, that our group of agents and interns, uh, Stephanie Rommelcheck in Westmoreland, and her summer intern, uh, Skylar Swan, Laura Maxi Ney in Hanover, and her summer intern, Shelly Underwood, uh, Trent Jones, Northumberland and Lancaster counties, and of course, Mike Broadus in Caroline and King George County, and myself, Robbie Longus in Essex County. So. Thank you again for joining us this morning. Um, the recording will be posted there at the link on the screen, uh, bit.ly slash VC Ag Today videos. Um, we will also have the recordings posted uh, of audio only on the Westmoreland County Extension website, so you can find those there. Uh, thank you again. We'll be back next Thursday morning um, with another edition of VC Ag Today. Uh, also, if, if you have visited our program before, uh, please take a few moments to fill out the brief survey for the program. You can find that link on your screen now, as well as uh, with the recordings uh, that are posted. So thank you again and, and hope everyone has a great rest of their week and uh, continues to hopefully have a good crop season, although we hope we can continue to get some much needed rainfall. So thanks again and, and hope everyone stays well. <laughs>